receive now these words that call us to this time of worship. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. Amen. Amen. This is a beautiful day in which we're gathered here together for worship. So first, I want to say happy Father's Day to all that are in this room, whether you really sired a child in the biological way or whether, don't laugh at me. Why are y'all laughing at me? They always laugh at me. Stop it. (laughs) Whether you brought a child into this world or whether you have mentored a child or children, whether you are the grandpa that does it all or the uncle uh, that helps with schoolwork, a brother um, who just loves that child, uh, all those things and all those people of who you are, we want to celebrate today. So happy, happy Father's Day. I, along with Reverend Angie, <clears throat> greet you in the name of Christ uh, for this time. Uh, whether you are a comm- uh, committed member of Blackwater, whether you are a first-time guest, uh, whether you are here in person or you are online with us, Facebook friends, thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you for being here uh, together again to worship the Lord with joy and, and with a fullness of heart. This morning, we're going to continue our our June sermon series called Last Words. And I have a whole lot of words, I always do, to share and to say uh, today and next week. Uh, But really, um, that is second place because the first thing that I want to do and that I believe we all want to do is to lift up the words of Jesus. And so we will do that today again, and then we will have that last word that we'll focus on next Sunday. So would you please now bow your heads and let us open this time together with a word of prayer. Great God of us all, we thank you for the glad tidings of great joy that were given to all people and for all times through the angels long ago that first Christmas morn. We are grateful, Lord, for the joy of knowing and following and worshiping Jesus and for the sacred privilege of sharing that joy with those who don't yet know of its true worth and blessing. And now, O God, if we may be so bold rain down upon us and deposit within us a fresh indwelling of the good news, who is Jesus Christ, who is joy personified. We ask this in his most holy name. Amen. Amen. So as we move to our time of sharing our life together, uh, if you are here for the first time uh, this morning, we hope you'll stop at that table on your way out in the back. Um, And there'll be some really friendly folks to greet you and just to hand to you a gift bag with some goodies in it from Blackwater United Methodist Church. We hope you will enjoy those. And uh, one of those things is a most current newsletter. And that helps you to see kind of where we are, at least for this month, and and what things we're looking forward uh, ahead in the future. So we hope you'll pick that up. Um, There are connect cards that are right in front of you, physical connect cards. You can take that out. We ask everyone to complete those, or you can use the QR code on that card and fill that out on your smartphone. Um, But either way, we really like to know who blessed our time together. And just uh, if it's someone, if one of you are newer to this church, we just want to reach back and say thank you for blessing us. So we hope you will all do that. You'll also find that there is also room there for prayer requests which we take seriously and take those into our own prayer lives, uh, both the care team as, as well as Reverend Angie and I. Um, so please offer that, um, that request or those requests to us if you feel so moved. Um, okay, a few things to lift up. So there's been three Friday Parents' Night out 
parents' nights out so far in June, um, and that is in conjunction with Vacation Bible School. There's one more to go this Friday night from 5.30 to 8.30. Uh, Lindy Sunday, our children's ministry director, has done wonderful, beautiful work in bringing all that together, but there's always room for you to volunteer. Uh, so if that's something you want to do, you can look for that on our Facebook pages, on our website, or you can call the church office and let us know how you feel called to serve. We would love to have you. It's lots of fun. Um, student ministries, I've been saying this for the last couple of weeks, uh, under the guidance of uh, Chris Bowen, are doing some really fun stuff uh, this, sem this summer, swimming, going for coffee, going to uh, the park uh, together, and having that fellowship time and also that time uh, of devotion to God. So if you know a teen, whether it's yours or your grandchild or a neighbor's, uh, please share this information with them and to bring them there. I know Chris and all the other kids would love to have them uh, be a part of that. Uh, and then finally, the last thing that I will say, and I'm going to ask Rhonda Norwood to get ready to come forward. Oh, you're our, well, come on up, Rhonda, because this won't take long. Um, this coming week, Road Runners, uh, it's a group that, that was before the pandemic, and, and now it's, it's getting its feet up under them again, and they go out to various places for lunch once a month. Um, they're going to the dinner bell this Thursday. And so if that's something you want to be a part of, uh, information is there in your bulletin about meeting here at the church. And if you need more information, Debbie Simmons right back here, raise your hand, Debbie. Uh, we can put you in touch with her. So if that's something you want to know a little bit more about, just call the church office and we'll put you in touch with Debbie. And now uh, Rhonda Norwood, who is our SPR chair, uh, staff parish relations chair. That's like the human relations uh, committee of our church. Uh, she has have some uh, words to share. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so um, we have been working behind the scenes, um, SPR, both pastors, the staff, to make the uh, transition between pastors as smooth as possible. Um, and now we're getting to the point where we would like all of the congregation to be involved in a few different activities. Um, so next Saturday, June 25th, we will have a sweet endings celebration of service for Angie and Patty. So we're going to have like an ice cream sundae bar and some cake and brownies and things like that. It's going to be 2 o'clock in the fellowship hall. Thank you so much for everybody who signed up to bring things. I put a box in the kitchen labeled with ice cream social on it. If you don't mind dropping off your donations in there, um, of course, the ice cream in the freezer. Um, and we're going to have all that prepped that morning so we can all just come and be relaxed and casual and just um, hang out with these two wonderful ladies um, in that setting. Um, the next day, June 26th, Sunday, um, we are going to have sort of a transitional type service. Kenan will be here um, and will be present in both services. Um, and so there will be kind of a... a a blessing and a, and a transition um, during that time period um, as these two begin their um, their last services with us. Um, the week that following week, June 27th through the 30th, we're going to have the home gatherings. These are going to be opportunities. We have several hosts um, from each service um, who are going to be welcoming members into their homes to meet with Kenan. Um, they're going to be about an hour, hour and 15 minutes, something like that. And this is going to be a time for him to get to know all of us in small groups and, um, and to be able to hear your wishes and hopes and concerns and things like that. Um, so there are sign-up sheets in the back here for the table service. Um, there was a QR code in the bulletin where you can also sign up for those. So um, hope, hope you're able to do that. There's also going to be an SPR representative at each one of those meetings. Kenan asked us to do that um, so we can take the notes um, as you're expressing your hopes and wishes and all of that. Uh, so we'll be taking the notes. That way he can be fully present with you and, um, and spend that time in fellowship with you. Um, then July 3rd will be his first Sunday here um, uh, as our pastor, as our lead pastor. Um, and because that's a holiday weekend, we weren't going to do anything that weekend. We figured a lot of people might be out of town. The next Sunday, Miss Ann and Miss Tammy are going to be hosting a reception to welcome 
him and his family um, in between the two services. And so if you would like to help with that, um, if you can get with those two wonderful woman, women um, for that. I just want to underline, you know, everything Rhonda said. Uh, we want to see, me and Angie want to see all of you here on Saturday to eat ice cream. Uh, I think that's probably when the tears will really come for us is when we can let loose and, and all that. But I think the greater thing is uh, the week of those home gatherings. Because I'll tell you, when I got here, many of you hosted uh, and opened your home for me and for my spouse, Jimmy, to come. Uh, and we had several of those uh, that went on, and it really was just wonderful to, to gather with smaller groups that we could hear your voice. Because like right here, it's not really dialogue, right? Um, but those were so instrumental in helping us acclimate to the life of Blackwater. And so it truly is a gift if you are able to attend one of those uh, that will be received by Kenan, and hopefully his wife will be able to join him for some of those as well. So please, please sign up for those um, as you are able. So our flowers are given in memory, and thank you, Terry. I don't know what made you think there's no flowers up there. Oh, Miss Ann. Well, thank you, Ann. Um, the flowers were, were in the sacristy, but we welcome them now, and we give thanks. They are given in memory of Stan Forbes for his birthday by Virgie and their family. So, Virgie, I know you're here somewhere, I thought. There you are. We're with you, Virgie, remembering Stan and remembering your family uh, on this day. So thank you for the gift. Thank you for the gift. So now we invite you to stand as you are able. Uh, it is our practice that we greet each other with happiness and joy in our hearts. Welcome each other in the name of Christ. And make sure you tell our Facebook friends good morning. Give them a wave. Now let us remain standing as we sing our opening hymn this morning. It's hymn number 617. The words will be on the screen before you. Now let us remain standing as we say together what we believe through the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> I think. Perhaps. Here we go. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> this is This is 
Will you pray with me? Oh God, who is greater than the most powerful forces in this world, enable us to be still this morning and know that you are God. O oh Lord, who answers out of the whirlwind of everyday life, breathe in us your Holy Spirit to strengthen, comfort, and guide us in the midst of storms and great joys. O oh, still small voice, speak to us this hour that we might become makers of your peace in our homes, in our communities, and in this world. Be with us now, Holy Spirit, as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen, amen. So let me ask you, have you um, ever taken notice of products that have the word joy in them? Have you really noticed that? Many sweet confections do. Almond joy, one of my favorites. There's a, a, something that I saw online, and I'm not sure if it's Kinder Joy or Kinder Joy, but it's a concoction of sweet cream that's topped with cocoa wafers. And then there's Russell Stover's Joy Bites, two kinds, peanut butter covered with milk chocolate and toasted almond covered in dark chocolate. Now, some of you might also remember a product, uh, Joy. Do you remember Joy dishwashing liquid? Yeah, I see some heads uh, nodding. It was introduced in 1949, and it was the first liquid dish detergent. Did not know that. Its slogan was, powerful cleaning, a little goes a long way. And I didn't know this either. They still make Joy. They, I have not 
I don't know that I've ever bought it, but they still manufacture it. And then there are countless books, countless books with joy in its main title. The Joy of Cooking, Joy at Work, Finding Joy in Medicine, The Joy of Being Selfish. I kind of want to read that book. The Joy of Sweat, The Joy of Pizza, Yum, Amen. The Joy of Vegan Baking, No Thank You, that's for me. The Joy of Living Plants, The Joy of Pickling, The Joy of Leadership, The Joy of Home Brewing, and I think probably my favorite from at least this list that I read, there's one called Choosing Joy, Choosing Joy. In the Christian life, as we talk about joy and experience joy, we we must understand that joy is not a product. It's not something we can buy. It's not something that we can create by our own effort. Joy, as described in the scriptures, is not a feature that we can turn off and on. And it's also not a feature uh, that someone else can turn off and on in our life. Joy is the visible fruit that comes from a relationship that is pleasing to and honoring of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Joy is a gift, a gift of the Holy Spirit. So joy is a significant uh, part of my personal life, continuing always to open myself to God's joy. Um, And it's been important in the years of my ministry to to continue to not only cultivate it for me, but help others cultivate what it means to live with the joy of the Lord. So joy is the last, I mean, the the third word of our series, as I said before, um, and that is today, the third Sunday of the series. So I want to recap for just a second of where we've been over these past weeks. So for all four of these sermons in June, we're looking at Jesus' final teaching, his final instruction, uh, his final prayer that he speaks over the disciples uh, before he leaves the world being arrested and crucified. Um, This section of the scriptures, only in John, um, chapters 14 through 17, are called the farewell discourse. These are truly Jesus' farewell words that he speaks to his disciples. So the first week of June, we were in John 14, and we talked about that word advocate. Advocate, such an important word. And I shared that to welcome the advocate, who is the Holy Spirit into our life, brings power that is beyond ourselves helping us to discern, helping us to know, helping us to move along the journey of faith with and for God. Uh, To have that advocate present in our lives is to work in and for God's kingdom always, to grow in those gifts of love and compassion and forgiveness and kindness and, and all of those things with not only God, but with all the children of the world. The advocate helps us do many things, uh, but in a nutshell, helps us to accomplish the person that we were created to be in Christ. Last Sunday, we drew our focus from John 15, and we uh, looked to that word abide as we talked about what that meant. To abide is to remain. It is to stay put. It's to dwell someplace. So you may say, I abide in my home. It is that place that you truly dwell where your heart is really, you know, sunk deep into the roots of your home. Well, Jesus used this metaphor of a real growing living vine with all of its branches to illustrate how his followers are to remain connected to him uh, by faith. That's why he uses Uh, that example. The most important thing for a real branch to do is to stay connected to the vine, to stay connected to its life source. 
only a branch that receives those nutrients on a daily basis will thrive and grow and continue to not only have life within itself, but bring life forward um, into the world. That's what a living branch does. As Jesus' followers, we are called to abide in him for the same purposes, to grow and to flourish and to have those shoots come off of our lives of love and peace and encouragement and and kindness and gentleness, self-control, all the different fruit of the Spirit that are named in Galatians. Today, we move into a theme of joy. And before we actually read our chosen passage for today, I want to just lift up a couple of other things that Jesus is um, teaching and instructing his disciples in this sixth this 16th chapter he tells them that they will be treated harshly because of him that being his follower will bring persecutions that some will be killed because they are following in his way he reminds them of that so that they're ready and they're not surprised when that happens he also talks more deeply about the advocate about the holy spirit who will come after he is arrested, after he is crucified, after he has risen, and then after he ascends back to God, he speaks more about the advocate. And for today's focus, we also hear the Lord's assurance that weeping and mourning that will be felt and experienced by his disciples will turn to joy. Now, that must have been very odd to hear from his lips when he's telling them, I'm about to go and I am about to lay down my life and be crucified, but you will at some point have joy. He all but guarantees that they won't always be distraught over his death, but rather they will rejoice. And what he's pointing to is his resurrection and all of the post-resurrection appearances that he will make, like they will come to see that he's not dead, that he is alive forever more. And in that, they certainly did rejoice. Jesus uses the example of childbirth to help them, the disciples that he is with for this farewell discourse, as he does with us right now as we sit here together. And he uses this metaphor so that we can more fully embrace and be empowered by this joy that he promises those who are following him. So now we're going to turn to John 16 and read uh, verses 21 through 24. And I'm going to be sharing from the message, which is a paraphrase of the scriptures, but I, I love the simplicity of the way it is written here. So receive now these words spoken by Jesus. When a woman gives birth, she has a hard time. There's no getting around it. But when the baby is born, there is joy in the birth. This new life in the world wipes out memory of pain. The sadness that you have right now, he's saying to his disciples, is similar to that pain. But the coming joy is also similar. When I see you again, you will be full of joy. And it will be a joy no one can rob from you. You'll no longer be so full of questions. Like they will know and experience the ultimate truth. This is what I want you to do, Jesus said. Ask the Father for whatever is in keeping with the things I've revealed to you. Ask in my name, according to my will, and he'll most certainly give it to you. Your joy will be a river overflowing its banks. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The scriptures are full with expressions of joy, some 269, excuse me, times in the New Revised Standard Edition. Joy, joyful, joyfulness are words used throughout those pages. The joy of the Lord, 
the joy of repentance, the joy of forgiveness, the joy of God's presence, the joy of salvation, the joy of knowing Jesus, the joy of harvest, the joy of creation, the joy of friendship, the joy of companionship, the joy of experiencing the love of God. Last Sunday, when we were in the 15th chapter of John, you may remember that we read this part of this passage where Jesus says, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And now this morning in the 16th pass, uh, uh, chapter, we read, when I see you again, you will be full of joy, and it's a joy that no one can rob from you, and your joy will be like a river overflowing its banks. So I don't know about you, but this joy is something that I want in my life. Is it something you want in yours? Yes, I hope so. And we should want them all the days of our life, not just on certain times and in certain places and certain occasions, but we should want these all the days of our life. But putting our finger on what joy truly is seems sometimes elusive. Like, what is it to have this joy that Jesus speaks of? While the world has its own definitions, I want us to more deeply discover and experience the joy that the scriptures bear witness to. So I want to go back for a second to the Old Testament, which we really should call it the Hebrew Bible, because to, the, to, the, to our Jewish brothers and sisters, um, the Old Testament is their Bible. So let's go back to the Hebrew Bible. And the book of Nehemiah is basically a memoir uh, written by Nehemiah, who is a Jew, uh, who is a high official at the Persian court, and who is leading the charge of rebuilding the walls around the city of Jerusalem. This is after the Babylonian exile. In the eighth chapter of Nehemiah, we read that upon completing the wall, there was a day that was set apart for celebration and for worship, and for dedicating this wall to God. Having gathered the people there and having read from the Torah, which is the five first books of the Hebrew Bible, Nehemiah said this to them, Go on your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom Nothing is prepared, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. See, the Israelite people have just completed that which God commanded them to do, to rebuild this wall around his city, around the city of God. And this inner strength that carried them through this rebuilding process came as a result of hearing the call of God and acting according to his will, acting, doing those things that will, will um, have them live in to what God is calling them to do. It is the surrender of what they think is appropriate and right and doing what God has called them to do. And this is the truest joy that we can know. What Nehemiah is declaring upon um, what is heard, uh, what, what he is saying is so much like what Jesus is saying, that to do my will, to hear my voice, to receive my word, and then to go and take action of that, on that, to do what I am calling you to do, that is where the joy will overflow its banks in your life life. When persons committed to God through faith in his son hear his voice, who surrender to his will, to surrender to what he has revealed to us, which is what he speaks in this text, we are certain, we are promised that we will know of that deep and abiding joy that he wants us to have. 
So what things did Jesus reveal? If he, if he says in this uh, John 16 passage, do the things that I have revealed to you, uh, you will have joy. What things did he reveal? Well, I just want to lift up a few. First, Jesus revealed who he is. Not who he was, but who he is. Jesus is Savior and Messiah, Redeemer and Lord. Jesus is the bread of life, the Lamb of God, the light in the darkness. He's the head of the church, the Alpha, the Omega, the King of Kings. Jesus is a prophet, a teacher, a high priest. He is Emmanuel, which means God with us forevermore. He is chief cornerstone and author and finisher of our faith. Jesus is the good shepherd, the fountain of living waters, the true vine, which is what we talked about last week. He is the good news that has come into the world. And there's so many other titles that we could give to him. But Jesus revealed who he is. Second, Jesus revealed his will. He revealed that which is right and true and beautiful and God-honoring. And he revealed to uh, us as human beings and especially his followers how we are to treat creation. How are we to treat one another in the name of God? Our friends, our families, our sisters and brothers in Christ— Aliens, enemies, religious authorities, government, countries, and nations. Jesus revealed his will in all of those places. And we can look to the Sermon on the Mount, which is in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, five through seven chapters, if you want to read it, and everybody should read the Sermon on the Mount. And some of the things that he revealed to us that was, that was his will is, You know, encourage each other. Love each other as I have loved you. Don't disparage one another. Don't backbite one another. Don't gossip about one another. But love God and love neighbor. I mean, there was so much that Jesus spoke about what his will is. And ultimately, that's what God's will is as well. Third, Jesus revealed some signs about eternity and his second coming. In John 14, he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you will be also. In Matthew 24, he made a couple of statements. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of God, the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Stay awake, Jesus says, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. So he tells us who he is. He tells us his will. He gives us words about what to look for and look to at his second coming. Jesus revealed to us everything necessary for salvation. He revealed everything that's necessary for salvation and what we are to do in light of that saving work, to bear witness to who he is and and his will and future events as much as we can. We don't know everything about what that will look like, but he's given us what we need to bear witness to those, to people who who don't yet have a relationship with him. He's revealed that which we need to be a light unto the world, to be salt of the earth. He's revealed all that to us. Now, I don't want us to misunderstand. We are not uh, deposited inside of ourselves this joy because we've earned it by doing these things, but it comes as a result of being actively engaged with his will, doing his will, doing the things that he said to do and being the people that we were called to be. It is a gift that is not earned. So make sure you have that in your mind. It, we don't earn it, but we receive it as, as a result of being the people that he calls us to be. Barbara Brown Taylor describes the experience of joy when she writes this. 
Joy has never had very much to do with what's going on in the world at the time. This is what makes it different from happiness or pleasure or fun. All those depend on positive conditions. The only condition for joy is the presence of God, which means that it can erupt in a depressed economy, in the middle of a war, or an intensive care waiting room. It is a gift. Which I believe is why Jesus in this chapter tells his disciple, you will be persecuted and you may be the ones to die um, because of following me, knowing me, trusting me, loving me, but you will have joy because it's not based on happiness. Joy is based on something that's much greater, and that is the presence and promise of God. So joy is not defined by whether or not we live in a mansion, whether we drive a Ferrari or our favorite car, whether we are sa sailing upon a fully staffed yacht, eating filet mignon and chocolate-covered truffles every day. It doesn't depend on whether or not we have someone who works in our home that draws that warm bubble bath at night or in the morning. I don't have that, <laughs> but joy does not depend on those things. For me personally, I would think that joy, the most joyful thing would be having a condo on Main Street in Disney World and a private plane to take me there whenever I want to go because it's the place that makes me happy. But even not having that, but it has nothing to do with whether I have the joy of the Lord living within me. Those things do bring happiness. Those things do give us pleasure and so much more, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if that's where we are seeking that fullness of joy that Jesus is talking about, that place where we will know of the joy of knowing Jesus Christ in the worst possible situations, if we are looking to things that make us happy, we will never find that joy that Jesus describes here. Compassion International um, is, a, is a corporation that helps um, children in, in mostly third world countries that you can adopt. And not to adopt to bring them into your home, but to adopt and, you know, scholarship them with a monthly gift that helps them go to school and have clean water and clothes and those kinds of things. I've told you before, we had a, a little boy for years and years and years, and then he aged out of the program, and now we have a little girl that we uh, adopt. But I love what Compassion International says um, on their website about this difference between joy and happiness. Joy is something grander than happiness. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit. And when we find joy, it's infused with comfort and wrapped in peace. Happiness isn't present in darkness and difficulty. It can't be present when its antithesis rules. But once we discover joy, it undergirds our spirits and brings to life peace and contentment, even in the face of unhappiness. True joy is a limitless, life-defining, transformative reservoir. I love that. Waiting to be tapped into. It requires the utmost surrender. And like love, it is a choice to be made. And Jesus asserts, it is a joy that no one can rob you of. No one, no situation, no person, no state of life, no bank account going south, no loss of job, loss of relationship, nothing can rob us of that joy. So what I understand Jesus saying here in John 16 really comes down to this, that joy is found in obedience. Joy is found in obedience. It's doing the will of God, which is the same as the will of Jesus. It's found when our hearts and our minds and our feet and our hands are aligned with the kingdom, with working for the kingdom and toward the kingdom and in the kingdom and inviting people to join us 
in the kingdom of God. It's when we are in sync together by the power of the Holy Spirit, doing the things that Jesus calls us to do, being the people that Jesus calls us to be, not relying on our own power, but relying on the power of that advocate. Doing more, accomplishing more than we could ever hope or imagine. And Jesus said that we would do that. And sometimes I hear people say, well, that's impossible. We could never do um, what Jesus did, much less accomplish more than possibly he did or anything we could imagine. Yes, we can. And yes, we should believe that. We must believe that in a world that just sends us reeling sometimes. So to close, I want to share a story with you that was just told to me an hour ago. This was not in my sermon, but when I heard these words, it was exactly what we're talking about today. So Mr. Ben Browning, every Sunday morning, comes through the adult education building, and my office is the very first door when you walk in, and he always stops and always gives me a hug, and we always tell each other we love each other. Um, and we did that. And then he said, I had the best day yesterday. And I'm like, really? What did you do? And he said, well, me and a few of my friends went to the Louisiana Veterans Home and we cooked for the residents pastalaya. And we served them a, a meal and we visited with them. And, well, you know, we just tried to bring a little happiness in to their day. And Mr. Ben said this, he said, that experience did more for me than for those we served. And see what, what Ben and what these other men with him, what they are experiencing is the joy of the Lord. That that is exactly what that they experienced. They experienced that joy that overflows its banks because they know in their hearts what Jesus called us to do and to be and to say and to act upon, right? Jesus said things like care for the elderly, pay greater attention to those in need. He said to visit and to bring hope to the marginalized, the forgotten about, the lonely. He said to feed the hungry. And as I, as I heard Mr. Ben telling me the story, he and his friends didn't just fill bellies yesterday with good pastelaya, but they filled them with the love and the compassion and the care that Christ has called us to serve up to people such as the ones who are living in this home. That is what it is. Nothing can rob Mr. Ben of that joy. Nothing, nothing could put a damper on that. Why? Because those types of things, those situations, those opportunities are given to us because they are the will of God for us. So my question to all of us is where do you see an opportunity to experience that joy? Where perhaps may God be calling you to go or to say or to be or to do or Whatever that looks like for you, that, that is where your joy is going to come from. That joy that will overflow its banks. What was the joy that Jesus had, writes Oswald Chambers? The joy of Jesus was the absolute self-surrender and self-sacrifice of himself to his father. The joy of doing that which the father sent him to do. Jesus prayed that our joy might go on fulfilling itself until it is the same joy as his. May that be so for each one of us. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Lord, we give you great thanks for moving in our hearts and in our minds this day and helping us to better understand what this joy is that the scriptures point to and profess. Lord, help us to never forget that that joy, the joy that Jesus finds so important to talk about immediately before he will be arrested and put to death is something we need to pay attention to. 
Lord, I pray that each one of us will open our hearts and minds perhaps bigger and wider than they are right now as we move into the world and that we will hear your voice, that we will know your will, and that we will do those things that you are calling us to do in the name of Jesus. For he says that when we ask those things, that you will certainly say yes and provide a way for that calling to be lived. So Lord, may it be so, may it be so in all of our lives. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, in a moment, we will stand and sing our final hymn as we move uh, forward and out into the world to be people of joy and people who extend joy to the world. Um, I have one more Sunday left, but if any of you... Uh, want to talk about faith, talk about where you are on the journey, talk about maybe you're like, I want to know more about this joy and happiness that Jesus talks about. Um, please, you got a week to call me and then you'll have to talk to Kenan, but he will be great as well. But whoever stands here, um, whatever that looks like today, next week, and on all the days to come, reach out reach out and have those conversations with fellow brothers and sisters that are here to welcome you to the journey of faith and help you move along that journey, um, that beautiful, glorious journey of loving God and loving one another. So let us stand now. Our closing hymn is going to be Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, and we are going to sing this with some joy in our heart. Uh, if you would rather look at a hymnal, it's, uh, it's 133 in your hymnal. If not, the words will be on the screens. This is what I want you to do, said Jesus. Ask the Father for whatever it is that is in keeping with the things I have revealed to you. Ask in my name, according to my will, and he'll most certainly give it to you. And your joy will be a river overflowing its banks. Go with the joy of the Lord in your hearts and in your lives. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
And the people gave a resounding amen. Amen. Have a great week.